If you have an interest in horses and love learning more about horses, the horse industry, teaching, or even managing your own horse business, then you're in the right place. We would love you to join us on our mission, which is to improve the lives of horses around the world through the education of riders, handlers, and trainers. So get comfortable, listen in, and enjoy. This is another of our popular Listener's Choice interviews, which we're playing over the weekend. We've chosen the most popular interviews for you to select the Listener's Choice winner. If you're not sure how the Listener's Choice competition works, have a look at horsechats.com slash choice for the rules and the leaderboard. Today our guest is Gail Sins. Gail's had a background in dressage, show jumping and eventing, as well as a few other things. She learned to ride in New Mexico in Western. She judges dressage now to advanced level, as well as running a busy riding centre at Gigi Ganup in Western Australia, focusing on riding school lessons and leasing, trail riding, coach education and horse adjustment. How are you, Gail? I'm very well, thank you. Great. Gail, we normally start off with a favourite quote. What have you got for us? My quote is probably a motto rather than a quote, and it certainly isn't mine, but it's nothing succeeds like success. And that sounds like a funny thing to uh, base your riding instruction on, but really I think as far as teaching riders and training horses that it's really important that have confidence, and confidence actually comes with having lots of successful repetitions. So... I try really hard to make sure when we're training young horses or even reschooling other horses that we offer them the opportunity to do easy things and to have successes. And the same thing with my riders when I'm training them. You know, I try not to overface them. I try to give them lots of opportunities to have a successful outcome. And I think that confidence in the horse and confidence in the rider are pretty much the basics upon which you can build. I think that's good. I think, you know, it's all that little steps, isn't it? Just instead of a big step that you may or may not achieve, let's just go for a little step. Yep, that's great. Keep going and another little step and just building up that confidence. It's the ideal way, I think, for a rider to learn and for horses to learn. And I think it's probably the ideal way to learn anything about life, really, don't you? Yes. Yes, probably. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Not just horse riding. Yeah. Yeah. Gail, you've got a bit of an interesting story about learning to ride in New Mexico. Do you want to tell us about some first (laughs) memories? Sure. Well, my first memories, I've always, I think I must have been born obsessed with horses and I don't actually know why because there was no horse riders in my family. And I didn't know anybody that rode, but I can remember from the time I was a baby, or maybe not a baby, I don't remember being a baby, but I remember I was just fascinated by horses and there was, television was invented, I guess, before I was born, but it wasn't commonly available until I was about seven and they had Western shows on the TV and I'd sit on my little stool and gallop along with wagon trains. <laughs> That was all I wanted to do. Every time my mother said, what do you want for your birthday? Oh, I want a horse. I want a horse. But we weren't in a position to have horses. So I did what a lot of little girls did and, you know, try to seek out places where I could ride. And New Mexico was not a place where there was traditional riding schools, but there were a fair few horses around. So I used to go and ride the neighbor's horses. I have to admit, sometimes unknown to the neighbors. <laughs> and <laughs> I had been known to go out into the paddock and take the boot lace out of my boot and fashion it into like a little strap that went around the horse's neck and clamber up on a on a rock or a branch and ride the horses around the paddock. So I did have a fair few falls. But um, when I was 12, my mother bought me a pony. Oh, did she? I got she, my first pony when I was 12. She probably thought that was better than getting annoying calls or something from the neighbour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, I had a pony, and his name was Pygmy, and they bought me a pony, but not a saddle. So I had a pony and a bridle, so I learned how to ride bareback. And then I met some other kids who had horses, and they had show horses and, you know, competition horses. So I hung out with them and gradually started um, mimicking them and watching them having their riding lessons because we couldn't really afford lessons. And then I started riding horses that belonged to 
the neighbors bred horses, so they had Arabians and quarter horses. So I started, as I got a better rider, because I was so obsessed by it, <laughs> I started riding their horses and, you know, it kind of went from there and I started competing on their horses and doing Western classes and something that used to be called saddle seat equitation, which was kind of a, a type of English style riding. Never did any jumping when I was in the United States because that wasn't kind of done where I was. Then when I was 20, I moved to Western Australia. And you had your own horse then, or when did you actually get the property that you operate out of now? Oh, okay. Um, Well, I've been here for about 31 years, so I didn't have uh, kind of financial backing, so I had to support my habit by actually having a real job. (laughs) And I worked in a riding school when I first got to Western Australia. I worked at Broadacres, which was a riding school run by um, a lady named Rachel Pardo. And she had two daughters, which were Dionne Bennett and Christina Slater. Oh, wow. So they were both very good riders. And so, you know, I had a great time there and learnt heaps and met a lot of people that rode and a lot of other coaches. So in those days, if you wanted to, if you worked in a riding school, you got chucked in as a coach instantly. There was no such thing as, you know, qualifications or education. <laughs> so I sort of started teaching then. And then I went to university. So I went to university when I was about, I think I graduated from university when I was 30. And then I worked as a medical scientist for 30 years. So I always rode and I always had competition horses and I always coached. But it was very much like, you know, the background passion. So it was what I really wanted to do. And, you know, I worked as a medical scientist to afford to buy, you know, horses and do what I wanted to do. I also had two children along the way. And we bought the property, yeah, 30 years ago when Ram, my youngest child was a baby. So he had okay. his first birthday. Yep. Yep. And um, I've sort of been paying it off ever since. <laughs> How, how big is your property? It's 140 acres. Okay, because you do a lot there, you know. I just yeah. thought it must have. And how far from Perth or what's the population like? Well, the closest regional centre is Midland, which is sort of on the outskirts of Perth. So from the CBD of Perth to get to where I am is about an hour's drive. Oh, that's not too bad, though, you know, for 140 acres, yeah. Yeah. Some people live in cities and drive an hour out of the city and they're still in the city. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used to live, live here. Well, I mean, I, well, I have worked in Fremantle Hospital when I was here, so mm. that's like completely on the other side of Perth. So, you know, the distances aren't crazy. Tell us a bit about, you know, because you know a lot of people that worked in the horse industry, you've worked in the horse industry, and you've had people working for you in the horse industry. What are the core skills or character traits that you need that someone should have before you would even offer them a job? What would they need to be doing? To work for me, yeah. it's great if they can ride. Mm-hmm. They don't have to be amazing riders, but they have to be reasonably competent riders. They have to be prepared to work when it's hot and when it's cold. But the main thing is that they have to be open and friendly and happy to work in a team and able to take instruction. They have to be responsible, they have to be reliable, and they have to want to learn. And if they've got that, then, you know, we can make great staff members out of them. And I have people that have worked for me for years and, you know, they're fantastic and I love them. (laughs) Good, good. All right. Now, what do you think then is the best thing about working in the horse industry? I guess for me, the best thing about it is that it gives me the opportunity to be outdoors to be with horses, I, I just can't imagine living without horses. I have friends who you know, have been riders and who've had riding schools or horse businesses and they've you know, decided to retire and move into the city. And I can't imagine doing it. I can't imagine not being able to see a horse every day. <laughs> so, you know, I just love horses. I love being around horses and I feel very privileged that, that, I'm, you know, that my life has turned out this way, that I am able to. Um, there's so much to learn with horses and, you know, their responsibility, which, you know, I don't find that onerous. I think, you know, it's wonderful. I love looking at them and I like being with them and it's just fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) All I can do is agree with you. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Good. Gail, what about people who've influenced you? You know, you talked about coming and um, working at Broadacres. Yeah. 
I think Rachel, who was, you know, the owner of Broadacre, she was a very interesting lady. And, you know, she was a pretty good business person, you know. She knew how to get the best out of all of us. Mm. <laughs> but as far as riding is concerned, I had a coach when I was in the United States. His name was Noyce Evans, and he was, you know, a very inspirational guy. And, of course, I thought he knew everything in the world. So he was, I guess, my first maybe role model. And then I was very lucky in Western Australia to be able to go to Franz Moringa when he used to come out here a couple of times a year and give lessons at Wyandra. And he was just the most amazing coach. And I'd never met anybody from Europe. And, you know, he was so kind and so knowledgeable and, you know, so gentle and soft-spoken. He was just he was inspirational. I'm sure that everybody that's ever met Franz would have said the same thing, you know. Okay. What about, I'm just thinking, because we've had quite a few people on the podcast that have said that Franz has been someone who's influenced them. So I'm sure if you go to right? horse, yeah, if you go to horsechats.com and um, just search for Franz, you'll find that there's been quite a few people. Everybody says Yeah, Franz, yeah, I think he's been those, quite influential. Yeah. yeah. What about horses? You talked about pygmy. Who else? <laughs> you know, I was thinking about that when I looked at your questions, and I I think the truth is, the real answer, that all horses inspire me. It's just, yep. it's astonishing to me that they even let us ride them. But my riding school horses even, you know, I'd look at them and i think, how can you be such an amazing creature that you will let a total beginner ride you? and plod along, and then you can get somebody on that's more experienced and they can, you know, pick up the pace and trot and canter and jump. I've got, you know, ponies here that go to pony club. They compete, you know, in mounted games and in eventing, and then they can also come back and take a complete beginner for a trail ride. And I think, isn't that astonishing? Mm, It's great. (laughs) Don't you think that's astonishing? I do, I do. And I think it takes someone to understand horses to have horses in that position. You know, like some people say, oh, no, he's a beginner horse because they don't go because they're dead to the aids. But that just means that they're only trained for beginners. If you've got then a horse that can go out and compete and do well, as well as being trained to be quiet enough, that's training and understanding, you know. Well, you know, I mean, they astonish me. They Mm -hmm. amaze me that Mm -hmm. they can do Mm -hmm. that, you know. And it's not just one. I mean, I've got lots that can do it. Mm. I mean, of course, not every horse is able to, you know, be a riding school horse and go out and compete. But just the fact that they let anybody get on them and and that they're able to learn, you know, to learn the aids and then to ignore it when somebody that doesn't know what they're doing (laughs) just flops around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, you know, I find that pretty impressive. Gail, what's been your proudest moment, do you think? I guess, you know, from a personal perspective, I won the Coach of the Year Award for WA this year, and I was very, oh, very happy with that. I was surprised. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> it was last year, sorry, not this year. You know, I knew that I'd been nominated, but, I mean, I do have a couple of high-performance riders, but I'm not a high-performance coach per se, you know. I mean, I'm a level two coach, but most of my coaching is coach education or teaching people at a lower level of competition riding. So I was surprised, but, you know, really proud that somebody Good. that's, that they, that they you know, can see the benefit of having someone bringing people on through the levels as well as just coaching high performance riders. Mm. So that was a proud moment for me. Good. Good. Thinking mm-hmm. about where you are now, you know, you've got mm-hmm. a busy centre, not just one or two horses, but you're doing riding school, lessons, leasing, trail riding, coach education, horse adjustment. I think you said you've got about 35 horses. To get to where you are now. 35 horses. We've yeah. got about 70 on the property, so it's really busy. <laughs> okay, to get to where you are now, because I'm sure a lot of people would say, I'd love to be in a position where I had a property, you know, 140 acres, 70 horses on the property. Thinking about but when you first got the property, what's been your biggest challenge to get to that stage? Money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I think that's everybody's, isn't What it? do you think then? Because it's money and time, you know? If you get if you go out and um, sell your time, then you don't have enough, you know? But if you don't <laughs> sell your time, you don't have enough money. So it's getting that balance. But for someone who wants a property like yours, who wants to run a centre, who just wants to live horses, 
what would you say to them? You know, what would you say as guidance to building up a business like yours? You know, I think that you have to make a lot of sacrifices. You know, you've got to eat a lot of beans and you have to sacrifice your own, you know. Most people that think they want to run a riding school, it's because they're competition riders. Mm. And that's one of the things that, you know, you don't get to go out every weekend when you're trying to build up any kind of a business, even an equestrian business. You know, you can't spend whatever money you have available buying yourself a, an expensive competition horse. You have to, you know, spend it on buying 10 trail riding saddles. So, yeah, you have to be dedicated. You have to be able to weather it when, you know, weather it. That's probably, the, actually, that's not a bad word. When mm-hmm. it rains and you've got, you know, you just have lost several hundred dollars because of all the bookings that have been cancelled. There's lots of disappointments, you know. But there's also a lot of, you know, uplifting moments as well, especially with training people. So dedication, perseverance. Um, If you have any source of money that you can, any finance that you can get, well, you know, I guess that would make it easier if you had a bit of a boost up from some outside finance. It's it's a hard board. It's a hard yakka. I don't make a lot of money, you know. Most of the money that I make I spend on, you know, paying bills and paying staff. So... I'm probably not a great person to ask that question. I'm doing it because I love it, not because it makes me a lot of money. But I think that's part of it, Gail. And people aren't going to look at your business and go, oh, wow, I'm going to make a million dollars. It's more, (laughs) that's the lifestyle I want. And for someone who is passionate about horses and wants to do stuff with horses, they would much rather do that than be in a corporate job that they don't like, that is a high-stress corporate job that they've got to travel to, travel back, you know? Yeah, yeah, and and yeah. they might use their horses as a release of that, whereas people are going to look at you and say, this is the lifestyle that I want. Well, it's what I want too, so I feel very fortunate that I've got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. So steps to doing it, you would just say, just keep going. You know, you talk about being passionate and being persistent. Yeah, I think the main thing is that you need to have a goal. So you need to know, you know, what you want. Like, you just want to have it so that you don't have to go to work or do you do you want to teach people or, you know, are you more interested in training horses to sell them to competition riders or, you know, bringing on riders? depends on what you want to do. I think um, my problem is I have too many interests. I'm interested in everything, you know. So I do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not sure, but I think probably to have a goal and to know what steps you're going to take to get to the goal and then be prepared to change the plan. So I always tell my my coaches, I said, you must always have a lesson plan ready so that you can change it. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah, having a plan and, be flexible enough to change yeah, it. Yeah, that's yep. right. So, you know, flexibility, humility, humour. Mm-hmm. And you need to have horse knowledge and experience. So the more that you can do to get yourself educated, you know, the better you will be at, you know, having a product that you can sell that people want to buy. Yes, yes, I think that is the education. You know, I think you can't just get your first qualification and say, right, that's it now, I've done enough. But it's that ongoing being open with your learning. Keep learning. That's right. That's right. Yeah. If you're an equestrian coach or a horse riding instructor, or even if you aspire to be one, have a look at the free video series for horse riding instructors on the Horse Chats website. Go there now. Have a look. Horsechats.com. Thinking about, because you do a lot of trail riding, okay, and the regulation within the trail ride industry. I mean, people can just go and set up a sign. There used to be a guy near us, actually, who used to, I'm not even sure he had the use of the land, poach the land, he'd go off to the sales, pick up all the dogger horses, put them in a round yard, get a couple of young people on them and just, you know, any of the horses that didn't throw their riders, basically they'd just go into the riding school and they'd just go off on a trail, you know, like it was totally, totally unregulated. I think it probably still is. Well, that's right, that's right. What sort of safety things do you think you know, I mean, you think about a goal and think about a vision and what you're doing, even though it's not regulated, you know, it's sort of along the right lines. What sort of things do you think the trail riding centres can take on? Look, to me, the obvious answer to that question is safety with all capital letters. When I consider that what we actually expect these horses to do 
is to have total beginners get on them with inappropriate riding, clothing, etc., and to go outside of an enclosed area where there's kangaroos and tree branches and possibly poor weather and, you know, the horse is uneducated and expect them to all come back in one piece. It's a big ask, isn't it? Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So, I mean, just by the nature of it, it's unsafe. There should be some regulation as specifically, I think, what people should have to have some sort of a qualification. Now, how that would be regulated, I don't know. But, you know, when you go to, like, it's a dangerous sport mm. and you wouldn't send your child to a school where there was unqualified teachers because I guess you're not allowed to be a teacher without some sort of a qualification. Well, mm. Mm. you know, trail riding is very dangerous. So we, you know, I'll be, I'll probably go the other way and I'm too safe, but I always tell my, my guides, you know, I go out with them and I tell them exactly, this is how I want you to cross the road. You know, this is where you need to stand. The first guy has to be in front. The second one has to be to the side, walking up and down. And, you know, these are the hand signals. And, mm-hmm. you know, I tell them specific routes where they're allowed to go. They always have to have their mobile phone with them. We have toe stoppers. We have Western saddles and stock saddles, you know, and the horses are suitably trained. And, you know, we know what order to put them in and, we don't let people trot and gallop off by themselves. We certainly don't let them go unescorted. So, you know, safety is the absolute first thing. And why there isn't some sort of a regulation about safety and insurance, I don't know. Mm, mm. And I'm amazed that, I mean, I don't hear a lot of anecdotal evidence or chit-chat about or or reading it in the newspapers or whatever about people being injured on trail rides. Have you seen, you know, much... I think, come up about that. Okay, so in Queensland it is regulated. Okay. Mm, mm. So, you know, there are regulations, but even the regulations, there's big holes in them. You know, okay. like you're saying about a qualification. Well, if someone's got a qualification to teach an individual rider in the arena, that doesn't mean they can take a group of riders out on a trail ride. Yeah, no, it would be very cool if there was a legislated requirement for them to have, you know, a qualification as in taking people out and that's the relevant to the trail area, riding, you know, like a trail yeah, ride boss yeah. qualification, yeah. Or a trail guide. Yeah, yeah, because um, just because someone can, you know, go to pony club and teach experienced riders on their own horses, teaching beginner riders with no horse experience is there's a lot of difference, and and even you know it's the same thing. You've got to be taught. You've got to go out with people who are experienced, who can teach you. And even even people who've worked in the industry for years, you know, they could look back and say, you know what, if I had to realise such and such, I can learn from that, you know. So they're still yeah. learning all the time, you know. And as you say, it's unsafe by nature. But, you know, as humans, we like the adrenaline and we like to do things that are a little bit on the edge. So yeah. to keep everyone tied up in cotton wool is probably not the best, not the easiest either. You know, we, we wouldn't go outside, would we? <laughs> That's yeah. true. But I think a lot of people, you know, when they want to go for a trail ride, they have no idea how dangerous it is. No. You no. know, I mean, I have people go, oh, I want my baby to ride with me, you know, on the horse. I'm going, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What could be yes. more dangerous than yes. having a beginner adult on a horse <laughs> with a, <laughs> with a baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I think most people that go out and trail rides, they have a really good time and they write back really lovely emails and the girls were so nice and the ponies were so lovely. So thank God, I'm just knocking on wood here, we have never had an accident mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on one of our trail rides. You know. And how I long have you been doing it, Gail? Ten years. Yeah, yeah. And you're not just doing it, you know, you've got 35 horses. You're not yeah. just doing the odd one, yeah. No, I mean, I've been here for a long time at the riding school, but I mean, you know, it's property, but it hasn't been a riding school for 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had another career, but it's been a full time riding school and trail ride centre for about 10 years. Gail, have you got a book that you can recommend for our listeners? My favourite book that I've ever read is for, you know, and the question one is Andrew McLean's book. Yes. The first one, The Truth About Horses. Yep. Have you had that one recommended before? <laughs> we have quite a few times. It's a fabulous book. 
you know, and it makes so much sense. And I guess because I'm a scientist, you know, the kind of scientific approach appeals to me. But, um, you know, just the way he breaks things down into the, you know, the trained responses and building up on, I mean, I, he just makes sense to me. Yep. You know, I think he's an amazing horseman and a, you know, great clinician, and I have a lot of respect for him. Yep, yep. And remember, you can find all the books recommended by our guests at horsechats.com slash books. You can have a look at the guest page for the individual book they recommended or just look at the recommended books by order of popularity at horsechats.com slash books. All right, what are you looking forward to now? Oh, so many things. (laughs) (laughs) So I don't actually compete myself anymore. I'm getting getting a bit long on the tooth for that. But, I mean, I do ride and I take out a few trail rides and, you know, ride for pleasure and take some of my friends for rides. But one of the things I really... I love I love coach education. Mm-hmm. You know, I really want to keep going with that. You know, we've got the ideal set up here for coaches to be educated because, yep. you know, we have riding school pupils and we can educate them in so many different aspects. So I really like that. So I want to grow that aspect of my business. Um, I have a couple of, you know, riders that are riding horses that are my horses that are just starting to compete, and I really love going out and watching my horses compete. That's a big thrill for me. Mm-hmm. So I'd like to do a little bit more of that. If I could find someone to run the riding school in my absence, I would do heaps more of that. <laughs> okay. Um, and, yeah, I guess more of the same, really. Um you know, I do a lot of dressage judging. I'm very much interested in, in judging, and I'm quite interested in para-equestrian. I'm starting to get quite involved. Well, not quite involved, but I'm starting to look towards a bit of involvement in that. So mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's so many things, Glenis. I don't know which I know. one to go at first. I know. It's, <laughs> it's exciting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And as you say, you know, you just keep going and exploring and... Um, you know, it's almost like you're just getting guided by what's available and that's where you go, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like sometimes the limitations of the body come into it. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gail, before we go, can you summarise your philosophy with horses just into a, uh, a couple of sentences for us? I think that I'd just probably say you can learn something from everyone and that people should be open-minded especially about other people's horse sports. So one of the things that I'm pretty passionate about is saying that polo players, polo cross players, mounted games riders, dressage riders, show jumpers, you know, horse endurance riders, we all love our horses and there's knowledge out there in all fields that everyone can put to use. And I try to give my riding school clients a little bit of a taste of everything. So I get people to come in and, you know, give them a little polar cross lessons and we take them to trail rides and we do a little bit of eventing and we do a little bit of dressage and we do mounted games and, you know, we do kind of so many things so that they can... I don't want... I don't like my riders to be specialists too early, you know, before they realise what's available. And, you know, I really dislike this attitude that oh, well, you know, they're not proper horsemen because they don't know how to do dressage. Yeah, yeah. I love for people to be open-minded and to learn and to cherish and admire people in all different horse sports, you know, and realise that we all all love horses, you know. We all care about our horses. It doesn't matter what kind of saddle you've got on it, you know. Mm, mm, (laughs) For sure, for sure. Gail, just in case anyone would like to come to Australia and go on a trail ride in Western Australia or in case someone is looking to pick up that job that you offered, you know, I just need someone to come in and manage the school while I'm away. Great. What, well, what are your contact details? Myself. Yeah, what are your contact details? Well, I've got a website which is Zia Park and I'm on Facebook. So is that ziapark.com, is it? Yep, ziapark.com.au. .com.au, yep. Okay. And my contact details are on the EA website under yep. the coach searchy thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And we'll put all your details on your page, which will be horsechats.com slash Gail Sims, or go to horsechats.com, search for Gail, search for Sims. Um, yeah, we can keep those details there, Gail, because a lot of people often are just driving or doing other things around when they're listening to podcasts and have a pen and paper, so those details will be available. All right. Yeah. 
Thank yeah. you very much, Glennis. Oh, thank you, Gail, for the um, the time. I'm, I think we need to come back again and talk about trail riding in a little bit more depth. <laughs> we got a bit stuck. Our topics were too broad. Yeah, it is a very broad subject, and I think it can be taken apart and um, you know yeah. talked about a bit more in a bit more depth. Great, I'd love yeah. to. Yeah. Okay, Gail, thanks for talking to us today and hopefully we'll talk to you again sometime soon. All right, thanks a lot. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Now, if you're still there, you probably know that I'm absolutely passionate about education within the horse industry. That's why I host this podcast. My other venture is Online Horse College. Have a look now at onlinehorsecollege.com and I'll see you over there. Remember that our comments and instructions are general in nature and do not take into consideration your individual horses or your individual ability and circumstances. If you enjoyed this podcast, then please leave your comment below 